All right, check this out. This is one of the most fun vultures I think I've ever built, and it's also one of the most forgiving. Um, I've talked about this build a little bit in my multi-cannon pulse laser video a while back, but I wanted to do a video that, that goes over how I put this thing together in detail. Um, and it also gives me an opportunity to talk about some of the more advanced considerations that you make when you put together ships in general, um, depending on their purpose and their intent. Now, I set this vulture up to be what's referred to as open safe, which is terminology among the elite dangerous community for a vessel that is capable of surviving a PvP engagement in open play. This sounds like it might be a little bit complicated, but it's actually not all that difficult. One of the big ones for open safe builds is an absolute shield mega jewelage of over a thousand. And this is because with a shield mega jewelage rate like this, you can survive plasma bombardment long enough to high wake out of an engagement. And this is more relevant for trade ships. Now, this isn't a trade ship. It can actually do a lot more uh, than anyone would really expect a merchant vessel to be able to perform. But I digress. You want positive resistances and an absolute mega jewelage rate of over a thousand for any ship that you fly in open play. If you can't get that figure, you need to get as close to it as possible because it increases your survivability. But um, this ship is actually designed so that in an open play environment it can fight as part of a wing. It probably couldn't take a meta out PvP Fertilance in single combat, but it could present some of what of a challenge against a commander who wants to kill you. You're not just going to be easy prey. And the way that it does this, first of all, is by optimizing maneuverability. In PvP, most of the meta ships are capable of boosting between 540 and 560 meters per second. You know, this vulture is hitting up on the upper range at 560. And that means that in a joust off between a Fertilancer or a Chieftain, the vulture will be able to keep up. It will not necessarily have engagement control, but it will be maneuverable enough that it has a lot more influence over where and how a particular engagement takes place. And because of the relative speed differences on jousts exceeding more than a thousand meters per second, when you add up the speed of both ships coming at each other, you do have the ability to escape an engagement whenever you want. So it's not full engagement control in that you can pick where the battle takes place, but it is a certain degree of engagement control in that you can decide when the fight ends. Now, it should be noted that a Ferdy Lance can keep up with you. So if you boost, um, so if you're trying to break engagement, you're actually not going to cut and run in a straight line the other direction. The strategy for a ship like this is to continue to actively maneuver as if you were going to shoot at the target, but with your hard points retracted such that you present the most minimal target profile possible until your drive charges and then once it's charged you maneuver to escape. It is very important one of the big mistakes people make in PvP when they're trying to uh, when they're trying to escape a ganker is that they fly in a straight line towards their high wake system and just hope that what that their shields can take the hit because if you make it easy for the guy not only do you have to contend with his plasmas and railguns you have to contend with his hull mass in a ram and he can hit you hard and ramming an Elite Dangerous does absolute damage. So uh, you need to make sure when you're fighting a PvP or in open play that you make it as difficult as possible for them to get their shots off. Don't cop out. Um, if, you've, if you're really following open safe procedure, as soon as you drop in a system, before you even leave the perimeter of the star, you should be plotting an escape system. Something close, something, you know, within 10 light years. An easy jump that you know your ship can make. And you should have that banked so that if you get pulled and submit to the interdiction, that you can then just hit your high wake button and immediately begin spooling for the jump. That ensures that any PvP engagement you get involved in can last, you know, about 15 seconds unless they have FSD disrupt, which they can stick on dump fire missiles and on, uh, there's a dedicated power play module that is also a dump fire missile they can do this. Mines can do it too, but you never see those really in any practical engagement. If your FSD gets interrupted by this experimental effect, then all it really does is add 10 seconds to the engagement. Your FSD reboots and then you're immune to the effect for like 20 seconds. So the longest a PvP engagement can possibly take place with a ship attempting to high wake, assuming that the defending ship is competent, is always going to be under 30 seconds. And that's assuming that you had your high wake system plotted before you got pulled. 
Now you can get your hands on, if you feel like being fancy, different macros that can run your nav panel for you and plot an emergency jump on demand. I've actually had the opportunity to use those a couple of times, though I don't currently use them because uh, most of those tools are written by individuals and they can be a little bit temperamental, especially when they aren't being supported anymore. Um, but I'm currently a big fan of the Aussie Droid Warthog script, which doesn't give you that functionality out of the box, but um, it does if you understand how to program allow you the ability to create your own custom profile to do something like that but I've never been bothered to so um, if I'm in open play and I'm going to a system that I suspect might be highly populated I don't go into that system until I have my jump calculations prepped to escape the system in the event I get pulled because in a lot of occasions um, when you get pulled for example a community goal when you're in a cargo ship you're not gonna win Unless you're in a wing, which, you know, adds another layer of dynamicness. But a lot of people don't run community goals in a wing. They, they just run themselves. So if you're in an anaconda kitted for cargo or a cutter or a Type 9 or something, your, your plan should not be to fight. It should be to flee. Uh, because there's not really a way that you can set up a Type 10 to beat another competent PvPer. And you should always assume that the person that you're fighting is better than you. That way, you don't get your feelings hurt when you die. You're, you're expecting it. But, um, you do occasionally get lucky, and you do occasionally get pulled by people who don't actually know how to do PvP and are just out looking for some free laughs. And if you've got a competent build like this Vulture, you can surprise them. You can, in fact, put up enough of a fight to occasionally drive a crappy player out. Seal Clubbers sometimes don't actually know how to fight and they just plan on pulling people that they think are less skilled than them and this vulture can be just a little bit deceptive to individuals who don't know what they're doing and it, it leaves the door open for surprises uh, so uh, let me go over the specific core optional and, and everything so that you understand what's going on the first thing here is lightweight which a lot of people don't expect uh, most people who do pvp do reactive surface with eh, something like heavy duty but there are some specific situations where lightweight grade 5 can get you just a little bit of extra boost to give you a little bit more maneuverability. And since the Vulture is already one of the most maneuverable ships in the game, I decided to lean into that as much as I could with this build. And spec it to keep my rotational and boost speeds as high as possible. Um, one of the cool things about this build, though, that I want to throw in before I go too much deeper in here, is that you don't need to engineer it. This build will work without any engineering, well actually you'll have to drop some shield boosters, but it, it can work. The core stuff that I've got in here um, can function. The capacitor will fire, all of this stuff will function to an extent that you could use this in PvE stock with no engineering modifications whatsoever. Um, you, you probably have to drop a shield booster for a heat sink or something just to kind of hold things together a little bit better, but uh, that's really the only modification you have to make. The ship will work out of the box, making it something that you can build over time. If you're just barely getting into engineering, um, you can put this together and then engineer what you've got and build it up over time. Although with some consideration too, I'm using prismatics, which are power play module. Um, in your situation, if you don't have power play, you just put a 5A shield generator in here. Everything else you can just get from different stations around this, the, the game. Um, but one of the first engineers you should prioritize, like you should try to shoot for, is... What's her name here? Let me get it in an aura. Get this thing pulled up here. I can never remember her name when I need it. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Here it is, Heritani. You, there's a chain of engineers you have to unlock to get to her, but she does grade 5 power plants. And you're going to want them because uh, the vulture... The Vulture's biggest problem is power. It it really forces you to power manage when you're trying to put together really complicated builds. And if you get more complicated than this, you start having to turn modules off and, and trying to figure out your power priorities and it all gets really complicated. So I'm not gonna I'm gonna save that for another video in the future because I consider that to be fairly advanced. Uh, but power plants and capacitors free the vulture up to be able to run more complicated weapons, but Bone stock, a vulture can do a pulse laser and a multi cannon since these are the most efficient weapons in the game. But for PvP purposes, uh, most PvP builds are going to run armored power plant. It lowers the heat output of your power plant, which lowers your resting heat, giving you more freedom to absorb heat in combat. And then Monstered gives you a, a little bit of a power bump at the cost of some mass increases, but it's not bad. So that you can get the most power you can out of the platform. 
Um, if you really want to run a power hungry build, you'd probably slot a guardian reactor in here for the extra module integrity rather than overcharging because it basically makes the power plant kind of tenuous and really vulnerable to incidental damage as well as module sniping. Thrusters. Dirty drives are the king of PvP. Clean drives are not. There's this um, this nasty little myth going around that, that clean drives are better because they lower your heat distribution, but they also increase your power draw, which means that your reactor puts out more heat even though your thrusters are putting out less. And in some situations, you can actually run into issues, especially in exploration, where the extra draw on the power plant totally neutralizes the gain that you get from your from your thrusters. In combat chips, I'm not sure how that may, how that plays out, but um, you should be aware of that. Um, dirty drives get you the maximum performance. Drag drives boost that performance even more, but it does mean that if you are reckless with your boost button, you can overheat without even firing your weapons. Um, this is where boost discipline and timing come into play. You can develop that with practice. Now, this build makes three specific sacrifices in order to maintain its high maneuverability and to keep power draw under control. Because you can see right here with, with hard points out, we're kind of pushing the limit of what this power plant can do. It just doesn't have that much more to give. Now those three sacrifices are derated frame shift drive, shielded grade five and double braced so that it's less vulnerable to module sniping, but um, eh, that's kind of a relative figure. Ideally, if you wanted to spec for maximum resilience, you would berate shield and double brace because that will give you a lot more integrity but for our purposes this was a sacrifice we had to make and that just means that if your shields ever go down you want to make sure that you're um, trying to get out of the area because 166 integrity is okay but mm, you'll run out of that pretty quick if somebody starts uh, tapping on it with rail guns 3D rated life support. Same story as the frame shift drive. Sa it saves power but um, we can actually spec for a lot higher integrity um, with the lightweight life support system reinforced to grade 5. Uh, 5A power, distributor, charge enhanced, which everybody who runs PvP basically does, with a few exceptions. You occasionally see weapon focused, but the Vulture is kind of a balanced ship, and it's a better idea just to keep the thing charge enhanced, because everything stays supplied and ready to go. It lets you boost on demand, it lets you charge your shield banks pretty quick, and it also lets you make sure that your weapons, which are the thirstiest component of this build, are well supplied. Flow control, because um, I think, if I remember right, we actually don't have enough flexibility here to run. Normally you run super conduits, but yeah, it pushes us over the limit, so uh, flow control to keep the power under. And this is where my personal taste in putting ships together is. I don't like to try to spec ships to run over their power plants rating as a personal choice. You'll meet plenty of people in this game who do. And in that situation, you could do, uh, let's see, you do super conduits, point two, and then in your power priorities, you would just make it so that your cargo hatch turns off when you're fighting. Now, there are a lot of people in the game who are going to think that I'm kind of an idiot for setting my ships up like this, but I prefer it this way. I think it makes, it's personal taste. And there's a lot of personal tastes you'll find in my videos. I am not the absolute authority on building ships. If you have a better idea, I'm not going to criticize you for, for taking it. And in fact, I do have a few ships where I power manage more aggressively. I've chosen not to do that on this ship because it does come with an implicit increased vulnerability to power plant failure. And because this ship is designed to hot bank, which I will get to here in just a second, I like to leave myself as much of an out as possible on the power plant, given this build's setup. So for my purposes, flow control. For yours, dealer's choice. D-rated sensors are the last major compromise that I make, but they are long range to try to get the 8.82 kilometer um, to get the most that you can out of them. Um, and it does keep the weight really reasonably controlled. So, um, optional internals. I went with prismatics, most PvPers do. It gets you a little bit more absolute shield control because in most PvP engagements you're going to assume that you don't have engagement control. You're going to assume that you do not have the ability to escape incoming fire because in a lot of situations, especially against something like a Fertilance, the only real control you're going to have is over when the fight ends, not over when and where you take fire. And that's through the high wake mechanic. Um, you should also note that the Fertilance is going to have the same thing. If the Fertilance decides to leave, you don't have enough mass in your ship to lock him into the instance like he does with you. So the Vulture does have more vulnerability in that regard. In order to escape, uh, in order to low wake out, I should say, 
you have to get really far away. But um, high wakes for 15 seconds, no matter what, it completely ignores the mass of the ships. So, uh, let's see. But if the Ferdinand decided to low wake out, he could just escape. And uh, there wouldn't be anything you could do except to jump to Super Cruise and try to tether him again. I probably would not to continue a fight like that. I would just chalk it up to he ran away, so I win. Uh, let's see. Enhanced low power, grade 5, and low draw. Now that is going to trigger some people. This is where it comes down to my own personal aesthetic. It might be possible to respect the ship to try to get that out of it, but I chose to do this because um, the enhanced low draw, enhanced low power, low draw prismatic shield still performs better than the 5A shield generator with high capacity. So I'm still getting more absolute value out of my shields despite having to pick a blueprint that isn't known for maximizing your possible potential power output. But it does free me up to run a few extra shield boosters. So I'm okay with that. It's a sacrifice that I'm willing to make. You guys as commanders can make your own picks there. Uh, shield cell bank. For PvP purposes, rapid charge is your best friend because it lowers the spin-up time. Now if you aren't familiar with... Uh, let's see, it's feedback cascade is an experimental effect on the railguns that neutralizes the shield cell bank effect. To offset the risk of getting cancelled, you need to lower your spin-up time since the railgun has to hit during the spin-up cycle. Visually in the game, this is represented by the wave of shield energy moving slowly through the ship's shields. Um, and once it starts to speed up, then it doesn't matter how many times you tap them with the uh, railguns that have feedback cascade that's not going to have any effect. They have a very short window, and with this blueprint you can take that... Uh, that cancel window from five seconds, I think, down to three. Someone might correct me in the comments if I've got that wrong. And again, I've had to go with flow control rather than something like, uh, let's see. Um, usually it's recycling cell because boss cells increases your spin up time. If you're doing PVE and you want to get the maximum hit off of each cell, you'll, you'll set it up differently. But for PVP purposes, you want rapid charge and either flow control or uh, let's see, recycling cell. Uh, I put a 4D module reinforcement package in here because I wanted extra protection in the event my shields go down since this build is is planned to go up against a theoretical PvP who's just trying to gank you. This gives you extra protection for the derated internals that have lower integrity. So if he starts module sniping, the reinforcement package will take a lot of the de incoming damage off of the top. And that's freed me up to, well, what that, what that does in practice is it costs you some absolute hull integrity. But you can make up the difference with resistances because the Vulture is absolutely packed with smaller internals that give you the ability to put a bunch of size 1 hull reinforcement packages in. So um, I can actually give you those real quick. I have run a mix heavy duty grade 4 deep plating on the size 2 to maximize absolute with what I've got left. And then all the size 1s are, are resistance configured. So uh, because I picked lightweight, uh, I had to lean into the thermal resistance a lot harder down here. So I've got three of them. And then a kinetic grade 5 with angled plating, because I don't really care about explosive resistance as much in PvP. It's not a good idea to have this be negative, because you do occasionally run into missiles. But I bias my builds towards thermal, because in a lot of PvP situations, you'll find the incoming damage mixture favors thermal. Uh, to a reasonable extent. Uh, plasma, plasmas and railguns, for example, primarily deal thermal damage, and then the uh, plazies split that thermal with absolute, and the railguns, I think, do like 10% kinetic or something. Uh, I'd have to double check. And then we get to the hard points. I have an entire video about the pulse laser multi cannon combo you guys can go into detail with, so I'll just very lightly touch on uh, rapid fire, grade 5 with scramble spectrum. Uh, actually, no, I recently changed that to phasing sequence. And that's because the rapid fire blueprint specifically allows you to apply phasing sequence uh, to a pretty good effect. Um, you can strip off you know, about 10% of a target's hull over the course of a fight if you're good with these things. And, and it's really easy to be good with them, but they have another added benefit in that if you manage to strip the shields of a target, rapid fire grade 5 on gimbaled weapons and even on fixed to an extent is better for sub-targeting because it gives you more rolls, more opportunities to hit the internal module for damage. Um, this is also true for the multi-cannon, but since it already has a fast fire rate, I opted for short range grade 5 with corrosive shell because it will uh, basically clear the path for both of these weapons to do their maximum damage against something like a Ferdy Lance, which has some of the thickest armor in the game, beaten out only by the Type 10. 
So in, in these situations where I've only got one multi-cannon, yeah, it's a great three running corrosive shell. If you have a ship with more hard points, you'd probably stick corrosive shell on one of your smaller multi-cannons, but the Vulture doesn't get that luxury. And if you lay into a target with both of these, targeting a, a specific module, in, then you can actually strip it down pretty well. If that module hasn't been specifically reinforced with an experimental effect, this thing will make pretty short work of stuff like your life support or your power distributor, which are typically never shielded in PV... well, mine is. Um, a lot of PVPers will run lightweight to try to save mass and improve maneuverability. I chose not to make that particular sacrifice because um, if this life support system ever gets blown out, you got seven and a half minutes to get back to the station, which in Elite Dangerous time is, is just enough to make that work. Um, a lot of PVPers will run A-rated modules because they expect their canopy to get blown out, but this is not a ship that's designed to run without shields. So um, the strategy with this vulture is if your shields go, so do you. You buck out of the instance if they drop because it's you know if, if the guy you're fighting is really good at subtargeting you're just not gonna you're not gonna last very long. He'll start working through your modules and figuring out what's reinforced and what's not. Um, another consideration to keep in mind is that uh, <laughs> dirty drives lowers the integrity of the module. So if you start seeing missile warnings, you need to make sure that your ass is not pointed in his general direction because he will shoot you out in two missiles flat. Um, you also need to watch for wraparound because a uh, really good PvPer will take advantage of the fact that once a missile gets a target lock, it takes like four or five seconds of no Fs given to break that target lock, assuming he's not looking right at you. So if he flips his ship around the right direction, he can fire those missiles and wrap them around to hit you from behind, even though you're facing him. Uh, watch out for that. I've done that to... you can do that to NPCs for a good example, but it's not very hard to figure out. And... Uh, it only takes two direct hits to your engine block to knock your thrusters out, at which point the fight is over. You're not going to get your thrusters back before he kills you. Um, let's see, other considerations. The frame shift drive is a favorite target to poke. I'm not the biggest fan of the sacrifice I had to make in order to, to do this, but I'm, I'm willing to take the risk because I've got prismatics and um, skill boosters over here. Uh, shield boosters are your best friend even to the extent that I've been willing to sacrifice a heat sink to offset my shield cell bank in order to have extra shield integrity. Uh, which means that uh, in, tec in technical vernacular and Elite Dangerous, this is a hot banking build, which puts a lot more emphasis on timing when and where you fire this thing off, because you have absolutely nothing to offset its heat except for the engineering effects, which um, help just a teensy, teensy bit, and, uh, well, that's basically it. Um, if you pop this cell with good planning, you'll overheat to about 160 and then cool back down. In my testing, the ship has been able to take that. Um, you won't see any significant weapon malfunctions or internal malfunctions. But if you're bad on your timing and you're forced to pop that shield cell while you're face tanking somebody and actively firing your weapons while boosting, um, you can see your heat thresholds go north of 250 pretty quick, especially if you let your power capacitor get drained. Fun fact, um, the lower your capacitor is and the more that your energy weapons heat up, the more heat that they will generate, the lower the capacitor gets. So, I mean, it's a compounding effect and it gets nasty. So this puts a lot on you to plan your maneuvers ahead and make sure that you pop this thing at the right place in time, because if you don't, uh, it takes a long time to bleed off 250% heat, and by the time you cool your ship down, you're going to start seeing internals over here uh, begin to twitch out a little bit. Uh, once your hard points start malfunctioning, you should start thinking about breaking the engagement and getting out, because you're, uh, you're probably not going to win if your DPS is coming in under target when you need it most. Uh, the shield booster mix is thermal, heavy duty, thermal, thermal. And that's because I'm running a uh, low power grade 5 shield and I'm not able to take advantage of the thermal reinforcement, which generally balances shield resistances and then allows you to stack heavy duty shield boosters to your heart's content. Um, it's another sacrifice to get to work on the Vulture's available power, but it's one that I think is paid off pretty well because it does give you uh, a pretty healthy amount of shields and hull, something that you can work with, a good starting point before you try to move on to something bigger and a little bit harder to fly, like a Chieftain or a Fertilance. Uh, any other considerations? Profiles. Um, 
Part of the reason why I went with this weapon combination, again I go into detail, uh, greater detail in my video, is that it offers a lot of forgiveness. You can see with just two pips in weapons, you get 25 seconds of unconstrained, both hard points cranking out weapons fire, which is more than enough for a typical PvP engagement. And it means that even if you're face tanking somebody down for a joust, the, you can have four pips in systems and have your damage output reasonably unaffected. Although you should note, um, two pips to weapons, as the capacitor drains, the pulse laser is going to put out more heat. Um, so plan around that, because it means that your timing is uh, your timing for popping the shield cell bank is going to be affected, but not by much. It's just you know being aware of it and popping at the right time. Uh, do, 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 is there anything else? Um, Oh yeah, it only takes three pips, so the capacitor never drains. And what that means is that you don't you don't have to be on your capacitor as aggressively as you do with other builds. You can throw your pips around. You always have two free pips that you can send anywhere and still be competent in combat. Even with one pip to weapons, you've got 12 seconds of unconstrained fire, both hard points cranking out. Um, and even if you pull everything from the capacitor, you still get eight seconds of unconstrained. I'm going to go to town on your shields while I pass you by at 1,000 meters per second fun. So... Uh, that's everything I've got. If you guys have any questions or want me to go over any other builds, uh, let me know in the comments.